one. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming today on, on this election day. I'm glad people, so, so many of you can make it. It's wonderful to have you all here. And it's particularly wonderful to have Fernando here. Um, so we have Fernando Ziganoff, who's one of our intrepid PhD students in the mechanical engineering department here. And Fernando is actually going to be giving his, is it fair to call it a practice talk of your thesis well, defense? Well, not really. Not really. I actually changed my mind because I didn't want to bore you with like two PhD defenses. That would be quite annoying. And I think this is actually the more interesting part of the presentation that can actually be useful for, for the, the audience. So I'm oh. just going to be talking about the, the latter half of my, of my thesis work. Oh, okay, the latter half. Okay, well, well so, so some subset of your thesis work you'll be talking about today. Well, yes. what's well, wonderful. You don't have to worry about boring me. I'm your committee member. It's my job to stick through it, so no worries. <laughs> uh, so, but the, uh, but, and, and, for, and for background, you know, uh, so, so uh, his PhD work uh, involves, uh, developed the area of vortex dynamics on the wake of a bluff body relevant to cargo aircraft applications where active flow control was explored with, novel with a novel technique discussed in this talk. Uh, in the past, Fernando has obtained his bachelor's degree from the Universidade de Valo de Rio de Sinos. Did I get that? That's, uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty oh good. Oh my gosh, I, 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 pretty good, I will accept. In Brazil in 2017, um, it, had, it, had, it had a lot of industrial experience as a system engineer building large scale refrigeration plants for food, pro for food processing plants from 2009 to 2017. So that, that's your professional background. And I'll also say, Fernando has made some really cool side projects in control systems and robotics. I, I only know about two of them. One of which uh, was, was, what was the name of the, of, of the website that featured your, uh, your, 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 your oh, water Hackaday, droplet right? experiment? Hackaday, yeah, yeah, you know, Hackaday.com Hackaday, yeah, yeah. Hackaday and featured one of his uh, uh, basically water droplet suspension experiments and uh, he actually, which you actually presented to my control systems class. So, so uh, well-rounded guy. And the Z-transform. And <laughs> specifically, that's yes, very, so very fun. So I'm very excited to have Fernando here today and, and Fernando, please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Vicky. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you everyone for coming, uh, even though it's an optional. Uh, I appreciate you giving my, me some emotional support here. Um, I apologize if I'm, if I'm going to be looking to the side, it's just that my screen, uh, I'm projecting my second screen. But uh, I'm basically going to be talking about the latter half of my thesis, as I discussed, which is uh, on the topic of experimental optimization of microjet actuator location for active flow control. And um, basically, I'm going to be defending the whole thesis on this Friday. So if you want to be, uh, if you want to be there and watch it, uh, I can, uh, I should probably just put the Zoom link. I'll put that later in the chat, uh, just uh, uh, for everyone. But, um, okay, but I actually, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technique itself, so that's why it's gonna be a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worthwhile. So, okay, so let's uh, just first uh, talk a little bit about the optimization itself, which is obviously a great tool for solving very difficult problems in engineering. Uh, and we basically, what we do is we black box our, extremely difficult problem into a number, a cost function. Uh, this number, uh, we usually call it J, uh, and it encodes whatever we want to optimize. Uh, of course, there's, there's also cost functions that are multi-objective, uh, which we're not going to be touching in this, uh, in this talk here. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, I'm going to give, uh, uh, I'm going to put here a, um, a cost function uh, which is actually, it's a dumb cost function. It's just the, the peaks function from MATLAB which is a function of X and Y, which means that you can plot it, right? So basically the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, and it, it has some you know, bumpy uh, terrain to it. And the cost function minimization algorithms, it will, um, uh, they will basically attempt to find the deepest peak of this function, right? So uh, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar, probably uh, the, the more experienced grad students know fmincon, which is one of the functions in MATLAB that you can use. And the default setting is uh, uses the interior point algorithm. And here I'm just going to play uh, what this function does. So every point in this movie is an evaluation of the cost function and the algorithm kind of, you know, at work. And, you know, it, it keeps on evaluating the cost function. It kind of uh, uh, scouts the space and then eventually it finds uh, the minimum and it's kind of certain that, that that is the minimum of the cost function. So that's great. And you can see here, the minimum is there's a black point in the, in the center of the trough. So, okay, so that's very good. But um, uh, we're talking about experimental optimization, which means that 
we have some measurement uncertainty, which means that uh, the, the cost function, it, it has some random noise to it. Or in other words, every time you take a measurement, you're gonna take, uh, uh, you're gonna kind of have to flip the coin again and get an, another random number added to the true value of the cost function, which means that now the algorithm might not work as well. And this is basically uh, one of the issues that we have with most of the algorithms. So I'm just gonna play the movie again. Uh, you can barely see the noise is there. Yeah, you can see it's a very, it's a tiny value of the noise. And if I play the movie, uh, you're gonna see that the, the, the sorry, the, the algorithm, it um, kind of narrows down into this point here. And you can see the black point, which is supposedly the solution. Uh, it's not even a minimum, uh, which is very strange. And um, this is, uh, something went wrong. And just so you can kind of see the noise, this is how it would look like. This uh, is basically more noise. And I'm just gonna play the movie again, but you can see that it basically narrows down to the same uh, strange location in a sense. So that's very, very um, uh, bad news for us because we would like to use optimization algorithms in experiments, but uh, uh, we, we have to deal with this. So what's going on? So uh, the problem is that optimization algorithms, they, they require the computation of either a gradient matrix, uh, uh, several um, 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 derivative uh, computations, or a Hessian matrix, which is second derivative, derivatives and cross derivatives. The formulation, the specific formulation of every optimization algorithm will vary, but it usually requires some derivative computation. And the problem is if you, if you have, uh, you, can't, you don't know the cost function, right? Uh, the cost function is, is if, you, if you know the analytic form of the cost function, you can just take the derivatives and find, equate to zero, and then you can find the minimum automatically. But the issue is you, that's, you wouldn't be using an optimization algorithm in that case, right? So in order to approximate the derivatives, you have to compute the cost function around the point and use some finite difference method or something to uh, approximate this derivative and then find the direction where you wanna go for the next function evaluation. And when we have experimental measurement noise, it, it throws it off because now we have this, uh, uh, um, varying values of the points every time it computes, which changes the values of the derivatives and then the, the algorithm doesn't know where to go. So basically it's like you're trying to navigate with a, with a compass that, that's you know, always giving you different directions. So you never actually reach anywhere. So, so this is, a, this is a, a problem and we basically we need algorithms that handle this. And there's actually quite a few, but I'm gonna focus on the algorithm that I actually used, which is the genetic algorithm. And the genetic algorithm, it, 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 as we're gonna discuss, it has some noise resistant, uh, resistance built in. And it's also very beautiful in the sense that it mimics Darwinian evolution. Uh, so it's like the survival of the fittest. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, and in this case, the fitness function uh, for the genetic algorithm is the cost function or perhaps the negative of the cost function, uh, which is uh, our J. Right. But it doesn't matter. What we care is uh, J and we just embed it in the, in the fitness function. Okay, so let's look at the actual algorithm. So the genetic operator has four, um, four operations. And uh, first we need to initialize it. So we basically spawn an initial population. It can be a random spawning or you can just you know, choose big points manually. And then we define a genome uh, for each individual. Uh, in the case of the peaks function that we were looking at, uh, the genome would be just two coordinates. So it would be like two double valued variables. Um, and then we evaluate all of these individuals that we, um, uh, we spawned and we get some fitness function or some fitness value for each one of them. So these are some bars just representing uh, what they look like. And then we perform the selection uh, step, which uh, uh, can take several forms, but basically you can have like a, a tournament kind of selection or you can have just select the, the best ones. In the case of the tournament, you can see, for example, individual one might have fallen in the same bracket as individual number eight. And then in that case, eight wins. So then number one, even though it's pretty good, it's, it, it's gonna get selected out. And the whole point of this is to, to get rid of individuals with low fitness. These individuals with low fitness, uh, they're fine. They're, they're like uh, in this animation, in the animes, they're like Vegeta. Uh, they're fine, but they're too weak and we kind of have to get rid of them. 
So, uh, which is very unfortunate, but it's part of the evolution of it. I'm sorry if this was cringy, I, I had to put it in there. Uh, so, <laughs> so then um, after we do the selection process, then uh, we, now we have only the individuals that made it through and we do what's called the uh, crossover operation, which is basically these individuals, they can reproduce amongst themselves. And in, in, in the case of a parameter space that has you know, some uh, number of dimensions, this is actually, uh, usually it's an interpolation within the convex hole formed by the points where the, the, the original individuals came from. Uh, so in this case, you, the yellow points would be spawned by this, uh, by this process. And then uh, later we do uh, the mutation, which is uh, basically for e each individual, it could be all of, it, all of the individuals, uh, we, we randomly perturb them. And then uh, we come up with a different, uh, a different um, uh, value for them, which we can evaluate. Again. And we loop around. So these are the four steps for the recipe of the genetic algorithm. We loop around and we do this for every generation. This uh, one loop is one generation. And we are able to uh, perform the optimization process. So let's look at it, uh, at it in how, how uh, it works in action. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with a no noise scenario and we're gonna show with uh, the same function and we're gonna start spawning a population. This population is gonna be selected. The crossover is gonna happen. The better ones are gonna be selected. Crossover is gonna happen. And it just keeps on cycling through and you can see that the population is narrowing down within uh, the, the minimum of the, of the cost function, uh, sorry, of the fitness function very quickly. And so in, in other words, it, uh, it, it works, right? Uh, to, you know, the same, the same minimum. Um, but if we shake up, shake up things a little bit and we add a little bit of noise, in this case, actually quite a lot of noise, uh, the cost function is pretty much, uh, uh, we can't really see the cost function anymore. Uh, and we run the genetic algorithm again, uh, you're gonna see that uh, it has a little bit of trouble, but uh, because the, the population, it kind of averages out the noise in a sense it acts as a, it keeps the memory of the noise, uh, uh, sorry, of the cost function within itself without the noise. And then eventually it, um, it, uh, it manages to narrow down to the solution which is great because that's, that's what we want. Of course, we still have to be mindful of the noise because convergence is slower uh, under noise, but uh, at least we, we can get convergence. So that's great. Okay, so, and also uh, this is perhaps anecdotal, but uh, it turns out that the number of uh, function evaluations is actually not that, that much more than the interior point, which is uh, rather strange, I would say. Okay. So um, now let's look into the application for active flow control. I think I'm gonna have to give you a little bit of uh, background. Um, perhaps you've already gotten a lot of background from the previous talks. So I'm gonna try to be quick here. Um, so the first thing is um, um, we, of course we want, uh, active flow control is a very, um, uh, pro, uh, a very interesting technique that's starting to be studied very heavily uh, recently. And FCAP is, very um, focused on the research in active flow control. And one thing that um, uh, is um, perhaps one of the, uh, the flow control devices that actually made it in production so far is vortex generators. So if you see, for example, in the 737, you, you look um, outside the wing, you're gonna see the, the vortex generators, which are basically uh, tiny little stubs that come out of the, uh, of the surface of the wing and they're there because they, they basically attempt to mix the boundary layer. So here's a kind of a drawing of how this looks like. So each one of these stubs is actually like a mini wing and the wing uh, kind of produces a wing tip vortex uh, from its tip. Uh, and then this vortex, it uh, kind of brings the fluid from the free stream towards the, the, the surface, which improves the mixing and improves the energy of the boundary layer, making it slightly more resilient to separation. So this is something that uh, has already been known for quite a lot of time and uh, you know, it, it, it made it into production. Uh, but uh, one of the things that is um, a little, this is, by the way, this is called a passive flow control device. And uh, one of the issues with passive flow control is that it's always there, uh, which means that you can't really turn it off. And this means that whenever you don't need the, the vortices, it's, it, it's causing you drag, which means you increase your fuel cost, right? So basically, if you, 
if you think about it, you probably need the, the vortex generators when, when you taking off, which is when the boundary layer is likely to be, you know, uh, least energized, the angle of attack is much larger. But then at cruise, you don't, you probably don't need them. So, but they're, they're there. So they're, they're just consuming your, your fuel, which is a, which is a pity. So um, we've been looking into um, technologies that can be deactivated, which is uh, what's usually called active flow control. Uh, so one of these technologies that we've been looked, uh, we, we looked quite a lot is uh, called a, a jetting cross flow or a vortex generator jet which is a jet that uh, issues, it's, it's literally blowing from a hole in the surface. And when you do that, uh, it's, it's, it's shown that we produce a counter-rotating uh, pair of vortices. Uh, and this counter-rotating pair of vortices produces a very similar effect to the effect of the vortex generators. Uh, so then uh, we, we can also produce the same boundary layer energization effect. Okay, so the question that I would like to ask here is, if I'm starting a project, where do I place them, right? And it's, it's, it's not a straightforward question. Uh, it's actually quite a, uh, it's still a research problem. Um, so for example, I'm gonna use some examples with vortex generators, uh, physical vortex generators or passive flow control devices here, just, just because I, you, I didn't find any pictures of holes in surfaces and it's not as interesting. So for example, I see this, uh, this, this picture here of a, um, of a car with a set of vortex generators in uh, behind it, uh, I, I would question whether they, they do anything in this flow. And for example, this, I don't think this makes any sense. It's, and it's also pretty ugly. It's probably just increasing the drag of the, of the car. Um, that's, that's my but, car, uh, Fernando. I, I take I take, I take exception to that. That's is this? A, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, if you if you're perhaps an aficionado and you want to just make it look uh, different, uh, that might might be a way of doing it. Uh, but on on the realm of people that perhaps take themselves a little bit more seriously and actually, you know, uh, want to accomplish something through these vortex generators. Uh, it, it's still very difficult because there's so many parameters, you know, like where do you put them, uh, how, what's the shape in the case of physical vortex generators. So it's a, it's a pretty complex problem and we, we were still working to kind of crack it in a sense. Uh, okay, so one thing that uh, we can do is uh, use computational fluid dynamics and I actually, I do respect my fellows, uh, fellow computational fluid dynamicists here in the audience. Uh, we can uh, definitely do simulations on this, but uh, uh, if you, this is uh, and this is actually one of the it's an absolutely beautiful simulation by KTH, where they show the flow field of a single jet and cross flow, and it's extremely rich. There's just so much structure and so much stuff going on inside of the jet that uh, you have to resolve basically, or perhaps you know try to resolve uh, to some degree of accuracy. And imagine now you need like, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 jets. You, you might be uh, having a hard time in making it work in your computer. You need very fine meshes and very, uh, very long computational times. But it actually has been done. So this, uh, these are two computational studies that I, I saw where they actually uh, use the, the, uh, the, an optimization, actually a genetic algorithm approach to find the optimal location. In this case, it's shape optimization on the right-hand side, and in the left-hand side is actually actually a location optimization. And the, they, they you know, change the parameters of the, of the actuators and find optimal configurations. Uh, the Reynolds numbers are still uh, on the low end, I guess, uh, but more importantly, these actually used the, the by then, uh, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world uh, was the K computer in Japan. So it, it was actually quite an expensive computation and they used a pretty large fraction for I think 14 days, uh, which is something that you know, is not uh, uh, exactly affordable, I would say. So um, of course, um, uh, we, uh, the question is, can we use uh, some other kind of super, supercomputer, right? And I know I'm gonna step in some toes here, I understand that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we can do simulations and everything, and I, I respect that. But uh, we can also use the wind tunnels as uh, supercomputers in the sense that they solve the full couple, fully coupled Navier-Stokes equations, fully nonlinear, by simply the fact of the wind blowing through the model. Uh, 
uh, which means that if we uh, and we the, the the whole point here is that we don't care about the intermediate steps of the optimization we only care about the the results right we won't we only want to examine what what's the outcome of the optimization and everything in between uh, we, sh we should make it as fast as possible because we we're probably not going to examine it so so of course um, uh, this is uh, perhaps one view uh, that i have but uh, i think there's a there's quite a few other um, advantages uh, namely that uh, experimental groups are more um, the, we basically we can't do cfd and i mean uh, it's uh, it's not very common to have it's a skill on itself it requires a lot of time uh, to learn it and to learn it you know in, in a sense that you can actually do it properly so we as experimentalists we kind of have to wait for someone in the cfd world to care about our problem which might take a while and it's a little unsettling uh, and we just want to help right we want to com contribute so so in in this case um, if we can use the power of the wind tunnel uh, as an optimization computer we can also uh, contribute to the active flow control problem uh, in parallel so this is basically the, the, the philosophy here. So now I'm going to talk about the flow, the specific flow that I'm studying, which is the flow over uh, the slanted cylinder. So the slanted cylinder is, uh, is like a bullet uh, with a slanted surface at its end, and it represents the flow over a C-130 aircraft. And we basically, uh, we examine this flow very thoroughly in the dissertation, if you want to see more details uh, on Friday. Uh, but for here, I'm just going to show the minimum to actually understand the flow. Um, and basically, uh, what I what I decided to do is to spend a lot of um, uh, fun time uh, building a system that enables the the wind tunnel to perform the optimization and perform these computations in uh, just as as a matter of the experiment. Uh, so, so I, I basically I custom built a board that. Um, drives a uh, hundred channels of pneumatic channels of solenoids and the solenoid systems and also an individually addressable array of jets so let me show you how the array of jets looks like so this is the physical picture of it and each one of these uh, each one of these numbers is a is a group of four small jets and this group of jets i'm calling a jetful which is a short for jet pixel uh, basically, we want to build an image, uh, like, a, like a, a binary image of pixels or jexels, in this case, uh, of, uh, of micro actuators that is the most eff effective in changing our flow field. So, yeah, so then um, um, uh, from inside, it looks like a little pocket that we, uh, of course, we have to mechanically seal it and connect a pneumatic connection to a solenoid. So each one of the channels will be connected to a, its own solenoid. We have 59 channels. And you see, I would like, uh, ideally, to have each jet uh, connected to its own solenoid, but you can only fit so many solenoids inside the model. <laughs> and this is a trade-off decision that you kind of have to make. So um, of course, experiments, they do come with their own limitations. right? Uh, but uh, uh, I, I just wanted to see how much we can do with this approach. Okay, so you've built uh, an array with 100 channels, right? So uh, what, what are you gonna do with it once you build it? Well, of course, you're gonna try and play Switch Out of Mind. I don't know if you can hear this. Which is just a demonstration of, you know, each one of these tubes is actually connected to a note in the, that is sent to the, through a MIDI file and it's just playing the notes as, as a matter of, you know, as the song progresses. So this is a demonstration of the, uh, the power, perhaps, of, a, of this uh, system. Right. Okay, so, so let's look at the, the actual flow field, how it looks like. So on the left here, you're, you're seeing an experimental reconstruction of the flow field through a vorticity ISO surface. Uh, and this is, a, this is a, a very interesting experiment that I'm not gonna have much time here, but basically we used an advanced volumetric PIV technique. It's actually not volumetric, but um, uh, uh, a stacked stereoscopic PIV technique. And with this, uh, we, we take hundreds of thousands of pictures of smoke, and we are able to reconstruct this flow field. Uh, really quick, and, Fernando, sorry to interrupt. Yes, There's a question from the chat. Was that oh, Guns N' Roses? 
No, well, switch out of mine, right? Yes. Switch out, switch, switch out of mine. Okay, let's make sure yeah, you yeah. questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, if there was a question <laughs> in the chat. Thank you, please continue. So. Okay, so, so the flow field, it looks like, a, so it has the counter-rotating vortex pair in, the, in its wake, and it actually is connected, so it's like a horseshoe vortex, in a sense. Uh, or a hairpin vortex, or some uh, some people would perhaps like to say. Um, and uh, on the right here, you're seeing the sketch of this flow field and how I'm defining the cost function. So the cost function I'm defining as the circulation of the left-hand vortex. And this is perhaps a strange definition of a cost function, but the, the reason I'm defining this is uh, in the, in, instead of just measuring, for example, an, an easy quantity like drag, is because if you look at the error bar size for drag versus, you know, given the available equipment and the error bar size for circulation, I got an error bar size that is smaller for circulation, which increases my chances of success, which, you know, is just a smart decision to do. So, so then I, uh, and it, it, not only that, but it, it, it's also shown in the literature that the drag of this model, because of the slanted surface is producing both the lift and the drag, it's the only surface that does that, uh, it's, uh, it's proportional to the circulation of, or the strength of the vortex, which means that I can just measure the circulation and that's a pretty good proxy for the drag. Uh, actually, very good indeed. So, so this is basically uh, what I adopted. Okay, so I'm not gonna bore you with the details. Uh, there's a lot of implementation details here. So here's where I would like to fire the poll. And uh, I would like you to think about if you were to look uh, to define which of these actuation um, locations would be the most um, uh, effective, let's say. Uh, so for example, just perhaps giving you a little bit of background, the, you can attempt to energize the boundary layer by placing jets upstream of the, of the edge or you can perhaps attempt to, uh, to modify the separation bubble, which forms uh, in this region. Uh, you can perhaps uh, excite the shear layer, which is what uh, this guy is doing, this, uh, this guy is also doing, or perhaps it's just a random uh, actuation system that, that works for some strange reason. Uh, so, you know, if you were, the, the question is, especially if you're in, the flu in fluids, if you were the engineer, you know, working for, for uh, Lockheed, and you had an active flow control project in your hand and you had to define where do you, do you place the actuators, you know, because you're going to do some wind tunnel testing or even worse, flight testing on this. Uh, how do you go about it, right? And, and it's a very hard question. I mean, there's, there's just too many degrees of freedom. So everyone so, in the audience, take the opportunity to, to log your answer, your guess as to which is the most driver, drag reduction, everyone, just to let you know. That's what the poll is. Yeah, yeah, I perhaps I didn't make it very clear. But um, all right, so we got, we got a lot of people. Of course, you know, uh, you, if, you, if you don't have any background, of, I understand it's, it's not uh, that easy. I mean, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time thinking about this, and even then, it's, it's hard to come up with an answer. Um, so we have 82% of people have voted. Um, let's give it uh, 10 more seconds. Mm. And... We're going to close by two minutes, I think, is a good, um, a good timing. I think probably the three that are left is just us. Yeah, probably us <laughs> so, at this point. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's fine. All right, so, okay, so uh, as it looks like here, I'm just going to show for everyone. I'm not sure if you see this. Uh, we, see, we see that a lot of people uh, chose configuration E, which is actually quite sensible. Uh, you, you're trying to excite the shear layer produced in the edge of, at the edge of the model. Uh, some people chose configuration F, which is like a little cross-shaped patch in the center. Um, and uh, there's also kind of a tie here between B, C, and D, uh, which are these three configurations. So now let's see how uh, you actually fared about this. So I'm going to just uh, pass the slide. And uh, these uh, this is the results that I obtained through measurement, okay? So, um, and apparently no one really liked the random configurations, which is, which is sad because configuration H was actually the second best. And it, it, it just, uh, it's not very clear why, right? 
which I think is a hallmark of how complex this problem is. Uh, but uh, I actually am I'm quite impressed. You guys, you, you did pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of people that actually chose configuration F, which is great. Or perhaps you already knew the answer because you, we, we already spoke. <laughs> that could be also the case. Uh, but um, nevertheless, that's great. You remember uh, anyways. So that's great. So uh, we see that configuration F is, uh, as at least as of now, is the best configuration that I was able to find for this problem. And uh, of course, uh, this is not by any means a configuration that would be regarded as standard. And the reason is, uh, the, the question is how, how did I find it? Right? So let's go about this. So um, basically gonna describe now the genetic algorithm procedure. So I fed some of the manually selected configurations, which are actually uh, configurations A, C, D, and some, you know, several of the kind to the genetic algorithm as like a starting population. And I let the genetic algorithm do its thing. So on the right here, you're seeing the genetic algorithm performing evaluations. So each one of these is actually one evaluation. This is like a time lapse of my experiment. And on the left hand side here, you're seeing the best configuration of the current generation. And uh, the, the bar, it actually represents drag reduction, which means you want this to increase uh, as much as possible. And as you can see here, the, the it kind of has a hard time sometimes to break through this, this uh, the best, but eventually find some spurious configuration that is slightly better, and then that configuration becomes the, config, the, the, the configuration that persists through the experiment and you know uh, through the selection process of the genetic algorithm. And as you can see, we're, we're approaching you know 10%, and I think we arrive at 11%, exactly. And then after here, uh, we actually ran the algorithm for more, 20 more generations, and we didn't really break this record in a sense. So I'm not gonna bore you with the remainder of this video, but um, this is uh, basically how the genetic algorithm found this configuration. This experiment took five days, 24 hours a day. Uh, the good thing is I, I was not there. I was actually in Orlando to, uh, in a conference. So I didn't really need to supervise the experiment. So, you know, it, it was very, very much a computation. I, I left the wind tunnel running and, you know, of course I was, I was, I had cameras and everything to make sure and access to make sure that I could turn it off. But apart from that, I, I was able to use it as effectively as a supercomputer. So this picture here is a summary or a bird's eye view of every experiment that has been done uh, for the genetic algorithm. And each dot here is one configuration. We tested 1,500 configurations. And you can see here that we start with uh, uh, configurations with very low fitness. And then, you know, as expected from the genetic algorithm, we get improvements. And um, eventually, uh, sometimes we get, you know, a, a little bit of a, a, a loss of, of performance as the genetic algorithm uh, perturbs the best solutions and then it, it actually makes them worse. But uh, on average, you see the population is improving. And then uh, over here, we stopped uh, improve, uh, remove, uh, changing the, the best individual. And then after this, we, we just um, um, settled into this configuration, which is the configuration on the bottom. But uh, one thing that I think you, you guys all can uh, agree is that it's pretty much indistinguishable, the configurations shown here one from, one, from another. They look very random. And that's not very useful because we like to understand what's going on. Uh, I mean, if you, if you threw me this configuration, it would be very hard for me to tell you what's, what it's doing. So uh, it makes sense to, to go a little bit deeper and find out what this configuration is doing. So for that, we're gonna do a process called in the electronics industry, Munsing. And Munsing is named after this mad guy here. Uh, which actually worked in a television factory, and he was an engineer that basically is gonna uh, do, did uh, what's being reenacted here. So he he came with a live board, uh, you know, that um, uh, with a wire a pair of wire clippers, and he started clipping the legs of components while the board is on. And as I can see, the board is happy, right? The board is showing a happy picture, which means that the board is fine. The components are not needed, right? Uh, but eventually he might clip a component that is absolutely necessary for the functioning and then the board becomes very sad. And then you know that that component is necessary for the operation of the device and you just solder it back in and you keep on doing that. And this of course was an effort for reducing the cost of the electronic devices uh, in order to uh, 
you know, improve sales and everything and, and competitiveness. But we can use the same philosophy for our uh, genetic algorithm to attempt to uncover some of this randomness that the genetic algorithm has as like a inherent to it. So we performed this Munsing process, which is shown here as a progression uh, in, this, uh, in this graph. And basically we deactivate the one of the Jaxels at a time in a for loop. And we deactivate one, we reevaluate the cost function. We put it back and then we deactivate another one of, the, of them. And then we reevaluate the cost function and we do that in a for loop. So in this case, the starting pattern has 21 we uh, Jaxels. So we evaluate 21 times. And then we find out which one of them is the least, uh, the least useful or perhaps even like hurting the performance. And then we remove it and we do it again. And we keep on doing it and we keep on removing Jaxels. And as you can see in the graph, the, we basically remove Jaxels and nothing happens, uh, which means that most of these are absolutely useless and they're just there due to just sheer randomness of the genetic algorithm. Uh, but then uh, at, the, at the minus 12 Jaxels, which is this configuration over here, we see a breaking point where every next Jaxel that we deactivate actually hurts the performance by quite a lot and the performance degrades very quickly, which means that uh, this configuration is perhaps the minimal configuration required to achieve the, the circulation reduction that we measure. And the good thing is this configuration looks more interpretable. So that's great because now we can you know, attempt to get some, uh, some working principle out of it. Okay, so I have to address the fact that the configuration is asymmetric. And the reason for that is actually uh, because we're just looking at one of the vortices, which means that, you know, as an optimization algorithm, you just optimize for what you're seeing. And since the, it's, it's blind to the other vortex, it doesn't care about it. So in a sense, uh, this is not a bug, it's a feature, but the, the, it's working as intended. Uh, but um, so, so we performed a particle image velocimetry uh, in the solution, in the asymmetric solution. And we measured the circulation of both vortices. And indeed, we see that the, the vortex that was not measured had a much lower circulation reduction than the one that we did measure. So here, minus 10.8 versus minus 6.8. Uh, when we force symmetry, which is the configuration on the bottom here, then we see a similar circulation reduction on, two, on the two vortices, which means that the, uh, the symmetric configuration is actually what we're looking for. So this is what we proceeded to analyze uh, as we uh, continued the study. So of course now we want to you know attempt to see you know what uh, what uh, what are the physics uh, uh, underlying this configuration. So this is a, an attempt to use you know many of the flow visualization techniques that we have to um, see what's going on. So in this first video, I'm going to show uh, and I hope this uh, the connection is good enough to show the video. Uh, I'm going to show the the surface oil flow, which is a technique where we basically, uh, let me, we basically seed uh, chalk, like, like just blackboard chalk uh, in, in an oil, um, uh, we oil the model and then we put chalk on it and then we look at it. And when the wind blows in the surface, it, it kind of drags the, the chalk and it makes some, some beautiful patterns in the surface. So here is the position of the camera and we're basically looking uh, from above um, so you're going to just see the surface and the flow the upstream is all over here. So I'm going to start with the baseline configuration so you can kind of have a sense of how it looks like. I'm going to start the wind tunnel and you can see the development of the, uh, of the oil flow pattern. And as you can see that, um, that there's, there's this uh, very interesting uh, arc that forms. Uh, this arc is actually the footprint of the horseshoe vortex that we discussed before. And this is present on the baseline case. Uh, we, we also have several other features that I'm not going to bore you with, like we have a, a separation bubble here, the separation reattaches, here we see kind of like a star shape uh, pattern that we, or a source point, if you will, that, that's the hallmark of the separation uh, reattachment point. Um, so now I'm going to turn on the, jet, the jetsels of the symmetric configuration, and we're going to see the effect on the oil flow. So it's actually quite interesting. It, it changes the oil flow pattern very quickly to a completely different pattern. And unfortunately, because the speeds are, uh, are on a little bit on the low end, it's not very easy to get the flow, the oil flow to flow in the first place. 
So I'm going to show you a picture where uh, we have the, the genetic algorithm solution on prior to turning on the wind tunnel. So you can see the development of the solution uh, of the flow field uh, without the, the baseline, because the baseline is kind of uh, uh, obscuring it a little bit. So here we're turning on the wind tunnel, and this is how the genetic algorithm solution oil flow pattern looks like. So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting pattern. Uh, it, it also shows the same arc structure, but you can see that the, the arc is much more pinched and it's the, the, the apex of the arc is much closer to the surface. And to my knowledge, this is one of the most uh, significant changes in oil flow that I've seen in, uh, in active flow control. Uh, usually you don't, you see slight changes in oil flow pattern. You don't see like this drastic changes that you can just like, if you turn on, the, turn off the jets, the flow completely changes like, like, like I'm showing here. So that was great to see. Um, and here is just a, perhaps a replay. Uh, we can actually see like these tornado structures, which is kind of beautiful. Uh, but uh, uh, in the, because of the time, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna touch on that. So, okay. So of course we did some more, uh, some more interrogation in the flow field. And um, here's a little comparison between the baseline and the genetic algorithm solution. Uh, with particle image velocimetry, where we're looking at the plane shown in blue. So basically we're looking at the center of the model. And when uh, the baseline shows the, the presence of the separation bubble, which is uh, enclosed by this blue region. And in the genetic algorithm solution, we see a very strange pattern actually, where we see the, this blue region is not a separation bubble. It's actually attached uh, but we have some strange flow pattern here that I honestly uh, have, I'm still having trouble understanding it. Uh, and we couldn't see it, but I th uh, I'm pretty sure there is a, a tiny separation bubble that we couldn't resolve with PID given the reflections of the surface. Um, okay, so one another thing that we found very interesting is that uh, if we look at the proper orthogonal decomposition, which by now you probably should be familiar with, because we had so many talks in proper orthogonal decomposition and model analysis. Um, the baseline flow, it shows what's uh, the, the first or the most energetic modes show the, the modes related to the breathing of the separation bubble, which is as expected. We have a separation bubble, right? Uh, but uh, if we do the proper orthogonal decomposition on the genetic algorithm solution, we, we see this strange traveling wave mode pair. Uh, perhaps it's not straightforward uh, why this is a traveling wave pair, but we have alternating structures uh, in the two first modes. And one of the modes is slightly shifted in relation to the other, which means that we, it's like a sine and a cosine wave. With a sine and a cosine wave, we can make a traveling wave. So this um, is something that we observed. Uh, fortunately, we don't have time resolved data to see whether this is a, a, a wave downstream or upstream. Uh, if it's upstream, it would be a, a, a result of the vortex wandering, just affecting the upstream. If it's downstream, it actually means that the, the, the jets are doing uh, exciting some flow instability. Uh, so this is something that perhaps uh, we will study more in depth as we, um, as you know, this work is continued. So, okay, so this is great. So then I, I, I decided to do just a little step further uh, and do some, uh, just a Reynolds average never stokes equations, uh, computations on this. And I, here, as a disclaimer, I am not a, a professional computational person. I have experience with ANSYS, and this is what, the tool that I use to, to perform these computations. But uh, I, I definitely don't have the same degree of, of uh, depth and, and um, understanding of computations that professional computational people, as everyone here, uh, to, to comp get these computations. So, but I think there's still some degree of insight to be learned from this. Um, and uh, basically, um, uh, here is just kind of a, a sense of how the flow field compares to experiment. Uh, this is uh, what I would call colorful fluid dynamics. It doesn't really give you much insight. But uh, if we do some uh, deeper analysis, uh, we can see that the, the genetic algorithm solution, uh, which by the way, it took, uh, I think, uh, about three weeks to compute. So it was because I used a very fine grid to resolve the, the tiny little jets. Um, but um, if we if we look at uh, if we compare the baseline solution versus the genetic algorithm solution pressure profile at the surface, we see this the suction zone, which is this blue region here, uh, it it gets uh, pinched in, in much closer to the to the um, leading edge of the of the slanted surface, and if we look at the pressure profile at the center line, 
we see that the suction region, which is already a lot, I mean, a CP of minus 1.5 is quite a lot. But uh, when, when we apply the genetic algorithm solution, we actually get a suction of about minus 2.8, which is about twice as much, uh, which I, I, I would believe is at least to some extent uh, what the genetic algorithm is doing to kind of attach the separation bubble closer to the surface. Uh, if we look at the boundary layer, uh, first, the genetic algorithm solution in CFD, it shows uh, this tiny little separation bubble. This is actually magnified quite a lot. So it shows this tiny separation bubble in the, uh, at the uh, leading edge of the slanted surface. And if we look at the, at the boundary layer um, displacement thickness, uh, we can see that the, the displacement thickness of the, of the genetic algorithm solution is much lower, uh, which means that we ener successfully energize the boundary layer. But not only that, uh, and I'm sorry if, I, if this is not obvious from the graph, but uh, every next jetsail or every next, next individual jet is actually energizing the boundary layer a little bit more. So this, the, if you take the derivatives here, it's actually the derivatives are increasing, which means that the jets in tandem, the effect of the jets in tandem is likely what's producing this such a level of energization of the boundary layer that it, 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 it just doesn't form a, a large separation bubble. Or at least that's my current interpretation of the data. Uh, I would, uh, I'm, I'll probably run some more experiments here to see this. Um, okay, uh, and here, um, I, I, yeah, I forgot to show this is our, the boundary layer profiles as we uh, get closer and closer to, to upstream. All of them are fuller, you know, but uh, even in the baseline. Case. Uh, so, um, but I'm not going to bore you with the details, i leave that for questions. I'm basically going to go to the conclusions where we basically found that the genetic algorithm is great, which is, which is awesome because we, we can perhaps use this to do further study on experimental optimization. Uh, but, and it also outperformed a human in the selection of actuator patterns by quite a lot. I mean, we, we were able to find a pattern that, that uh, produced a circulation reduction of 3.5% but the genetic algorithm was able to do about 11, which means that we, we, we got uh, um, uh, outperformed. And I'm not saying me, I'm saying my advisor. Okay, the experienced researcher here would, would be actually my advisor, uh, or perhaps me, I don't know, uh, both of us. Uh, and uh, I am actually quite excited to see what else we can do with this uh, technique, because not only we can do this with at much higher Reynolds number flows, which are con currently completely inaccessible for computation, uh, but uh, uh, also with com complex geometries that are perhaps even closer to application, like an actual C130 model. Like we can uh, just curve surfaces, make it the problem even harder to solve. And this would be a, a platform that would enable us to find eff effective engineering solutions to it. So with this, I, I'll finish my talk and I'll take any of the questions of the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. It was very, very uh, engaging uh, 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 presentation on this on such subject matter. It, it, thank you so much. Um, I'd love to take questions from the audience. Uh, you know, uh, does anyone have it? Does anyone want to pop in with any questions, or or am I going to have to hog Fernando? I, I don't want to hog him. Yeah, please. I mean, that's I, I've been I've been asking hard questions throughout. So now now it's my time. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, so just, I just want to get a better understanding. So did you, perf you perform both wind tunnel testing and that test took five days to simulate and then you did computational fluid simulations as well for, well, for this? Yes, the, the wind tunnel testing took five days. And this, this is, it's not a simulation. I, I left the model inside the wind tunnel with the fans on for five days. 24 hour days straight and the optimization algorithm doing its thing. Uh, separately, after I found a, a configuration that was very interesting, I wanted to study it a little bit further and I performed simulations on the, that specific configuration. So that would be for like further uh, understanding of the, of the solution in a sense. I don't know if that answers the, the question. No, it does. Thank you. Fernando, there you go. I have a go. question. Oh yeah, go on, go on Nikhil, then we'll do uh, an anarude. So um, based on uh, how it worked for you, like the, with the jets on, uh, the low pressure zone has got close to the edge. 
and probably that's how it worked. Do you think if we use suction instead of jets, it would do the same effect? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, the, the only reason why I think the industry has moved a little bit away from suction uh, is, and you probably are aware of that, is because if you have suction, you have issues, practical issues, right? You, mm-hmm. you, you, you suck all the debris in the aircraft, and that's, that's something that's not very desirable. So most researchers, I think, moved away from suction, at least to my knowledge. But uh, I, I would assume that, yeah, if we got suction, we would get the same level of energization of the boundary layer and also attachment in the separation region. Okay, yeah, I expect the same. So I think next we have a question from, oh, thank you, by the way, everyone in the keel and also Bryce for your question. So great, uh, keep them coming. Uh, Annie Rood, I want to make sure he gets his question in. Uh, so he, Annie Rood, I believe is how you pronounce their name. Uh, would, would the vortices affect the control surfaces at the rear of the aircraft? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, so let me, let me go back to the picture of the aircraft. So I think what you're asking is, and perhaps with the picture, it's easier to see. So I, I would say, from my knowledge of this problem, they don't affect much the, the, the basically the, the elevators, but um, I would assume at least to an extent. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the yeah, I'm not sure what's the, 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 the question. Like, it's, it's just more a practical question of whether they already affect it. And then if this flow control strategy would affect it more or something like that. I'm not sure if I got it clear. Eddie Rudy, uh, feel free to, to post a clarification if you, if, uh, yeah. if, as a follow-up question. And I guess in the meantime, uh, uh, we, I think Ross has a question. We can go back to Eddie Rudy's follow-up. Great presentation, Fernando. Um, Thank you. Always enjoyable. So I probably asked you this before, but did you allow the baseline flow to reestablish between generations? Yeah, actually, yes. yes. No, yes. that's a that's a great question. Yeah. So so first, there there was a delay of uh, several convective times between the the cases, mm-hmm. but also. I, I had a measurement of the baseline case every, I think, five cases. So I actually, I, I re-measured the baseline just to correct for some slow transients in the wind tunnel, which is actually something that I also measured. So yes, that, that, that's absolutely a concern. And it, yeah. has to, it has to be taken into account when doing the experiment. And then just, just to follow up, when you were taking actuators away from the optimal solution did you was there any concern that that may have locked on to some like new base state in the flow so taking actuators away wasn't really a not like they weren't necessary but the flow had established itself with a new base state you know you understand my question i i see your point but uh um i think it's the same it's the same question because uh, or at least I, I applied the same procedure for the munting process. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. every every five configurations, I would establish a new baseline. So in that case, I would have to have them off, and and then reevaluate the cost function. Uh, by the way, the cost function takes uh, 120 seconds to evaluate, which means okay. because I have to traverse the, the probe, right? So yeah. this means that you know whatever whatever was happening, it would it would um, it would have reestablished itself. And I think I think it's it's quite clear from the oil flow visualization that once you turn the jets off, the flow completely. Yeah, changes. yeah. Right. So that's that's something that I, I. But that's a good question. Yeah, and it's some. I was I was absolutely concerned when I was doing those experiments of you know getting to a somewhat uh, an inaccurate result yeah. by you know just the sheer uh, amount of of uh, things to care about, you know and. But uh, I think I think to at least some extent is a, the solution has a degree of optimality to it. Whether yeah. the, this is like the global optimum or it's just a local optimum, uh, it's, it's not clear and I guess we can't really find it. Uh, I think it's also a good, uh, a good um, uh, point, uh, a good thing to point at, is that the size of the parameter space for this system is 10 to the 21. So I would have to test 10 to the 21 configurations to traverse the whole parameter space. Which is not only impractical, impractical, but probably impossible given universe time scales. So, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, so it's like I, uh, you, you kind of have to do this sort of compromise, and I think everyone understands that. Thank you, I Except appreciate it. Reviewers, my reviewers, they were a little annoying about that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, any rude uh, as a follow up, uh, he said, he said, it says, uh, my, they say, uh, my concern is it. Uh, is would your vortices that you generate from the active flow control intrude in, or into or mix with the wingtip vortices from the elevators and potentially increase drag? I see your point. Well, I would say that probably the opposite because we're weakening them, right? So whatever, whatever happens downstream, it would probably be uh, a, a weakening, a weaker interaction between the two vortices. That's a good question though. I mean, I guess the only way to answer that, given you know the nonlinearity of the interaction, is to do it with the, the elevators there. But um, uh, that's uh, unfortunately we we uh, in academia we we kind of stick to canonical problems. I would love to do something like that. That would be actually quite great. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Uh, basically, actually, uh, you, you changed my question, Fernando. Uh, we, we said something about. It. You know, you don't have to get into the details of a reviewer debate. I, I'm not going to ask you to do anything, you know, reveal anything you don't want to reveal. But I am curious how much people cared, if at all. Did you say it was about local versus global minima? Is that what they seem to care about? Yeah, there was a discussion of, you know, like, uh, you know, whether, how can you guarantee this is a global minimum? But uh, I, I think that the reviewer was more on the computational side of things. So he, you know, of course, there's no guarantee. Right. right. Yeah, so 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 like I I'm always curious because I deal with a bit with optimization how people view the the the, the search for a global versus a local minimum. I mean, often I mean it depends on the problem how many nooks and crannies there are in your uh, um, in, in in sort of in sort of your object your objective function surface, you know. Uh, but that's hard to tell. But pe but like to me, it sounds like you're just trying to find a better solution. You're not trying to claim yeah. it's the global optimal solution, right? I'm trying to find a solution, perhaps. Right. It's like, yeah, it's like, I, or I, of course, there are solutions that can be found manually, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, perhaps a better solution than manual. That's, I guess, the, the objective of this study. So sort of related to that is scalability. I mean, you talked about, it, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, being able, you have only so many jetsels for practical purposes, right? But even with so many jetsels, you can't, you can't explore uh, exhaustively. Um, in, in other fields uh, that I know people do sort of this hardware in the loop optimization, uh, it can get pretty harrowing when you come to higher dimensions. I mean, one thing we do is exoskeleton research is people strap people into exoskeletons. And I, I know I told you about this and where they, yeah, yeah. where they'll tweak the actuators and then literally put someone on a treadmill for minutes and measure their metabolic rate and says, Hey, does it make it harder or easier for the person to walk in it? Right. And that can take days. Uh, you know, some of these labs who are running up just like you did, but yeah. like, do you have thoughts on the scalability of this to something like on the scale of an aircraft, like not just these canonical models? Uh, you mean scalability, just to cl clarify, scalability yeah. in the sense of translating Degrees the of results that we find in the wind tunnel to a larger model? Larger well, size, that, or a more or scalability model. in the sense of, of spawning more studies out of this? Uh, uh, I mean... I specifically mean like scalability, like that you have lots of degrees, potential degrees of freedom, lots of places where you could put jets. Like, I, like you have that that Boeing, that uh, that 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 seat, that, that, that aircraft in the yeah. upper court. You see what thirty? Thank you. Um, like you could put jet jets all over the place there. Are yes. how uh, so? And with more jets, the more possibilities there are, the harder it is to scale the optimization potentially. That would you yeah. have thoughts on that? That's actually a great question. Yeah, I, I think I think that's uh, where this becomes a compromise between a, a very hairy problem. Of course, it would be great to put actuators everywhere, but then the complexity of the problem increases to a, a, a degree that we can't really handle even in the experiments. So we have to find good candidate locations. And this is something that we can do. I mean, there's there's analysis that we can do even with CFD. There's a, an analysis that I think Dr. Uni is probably familiar with, Resolvent, and we can do other analysis to find potential locations where we can force this. But uh, these analysis have their own weaknesses. Like, uh, you know, it, there's linear assumptions and everything that uh, carry with them. Another, uh, another thing that I think is like perhaps the status quo right now in this community is just um, 
using your experience, which is, you know, like we know that shear layers are, are um, they're susceptible to accepting flow control. Uh, we know that boundary layers are also susceptible. Uh, so we place actuators around them. And I think that's, uh, that's perhaps the more sensible approach in this setting. You don't know exactly where you want to uh, actuate, but you, you have a guess. But instead of building a model with a guess that you can, you can only test, I don't know, five, six configurations, you can test thousands of it just by the sheer, by, by the hardware that you put behind it. So uh, that's perhaps the proposal of this is we can, we can, we don't need to know exactly what we want. We just need to know uh, roughly what we want and leave to the computer the remainder of the, of the solution. Uh, I don't know if that, that is great. To the, the, no, no, that was, that was great. Well, I think we're out of time for the, for the, for the, uh, for the for the session, but um, you know, I, so Uni, I, I, are, do we do we keep the the room open for discussion or? Um, yeah, if uh, Fernando has uh, is okay with staying back and if yeah, are, yeah, I'm more than happy to keep it live. All right, so uh, cool. Well, I'll stop the recording now. And but before we do, let's thank uh, Fernando again for the official session. Thank you so much for the presentation, Thanks and we all wish you the best of luck on Friday. And thank you everyone for coming as well.